Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Two Nowadays podcast. I'm your host, James, and I'm joined by my good friend, Timmy Long. Hi, everyone. Rowan is on the deck. Say hi, Rowan. Hi, Mary Crilly is in the audience. And thank you for having me. Mary Crilly is at the desk, actually. Mary, you are the, the director, the CEO, the manager. You run the Sexual Violence Centre in Cork. Yeah. Before we get into that, just for the people that don't know you, do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from? Okay, I'm originally from Dublin. I yeah. moved to Cork in 1977. I got involved in the centre before, just before we opened up. The centre next year, 19, 2023, will be there 40 years, and I'm in the centre 40 years. We started up nearly 40 years ago as the Cork Rape Crisis Centre. We were the um, second one in the country. So, I mean, me getting involved in, in that, like I'll tell you, I was living in Cork. I had a difficult relationship, difficult marriage, which was finished. So I was on my own with two young children, two young girls. Mm. So I didn't know really what I was about or what I was doing. I'd kind of barely scraped through leaving cert. If I look back on it, I would have got, I think, you think you'd pass five tests or something in five subjects. I barely got it. So um, for me, I went to college when I was 50, which is about 16 years ago. And that was because running a centre like ours, the powers that be who fund you were looking for your degrees or your accreditation I was nearly yeah. getting to the place where I think if I was interfered for my own job I wouldn't have got it do you yeah. know so yeah. that's what I did when I was 50 so um, I lived in a fairly big housing estate and there was somebody near me who said there's a group getting together looking at starting up a rape crisis centre will you join and I said no sure I hadn't been in any group do you know I just I just mm-hmm. hadn't um, and had you any history in community work nothing at all nothing Nothing. I mean, you know, I was about 21 when I moved to Cork. I had the kids early enough. I had nothing, hadn't a clue. Um, and I said, I will go. I don't know what drew me to it. And then I went and I think, being honest, I would have given myself six months because the people who were there starting up are really good. They were all um, academics or solicitors. They kind of knew what they were about. And I felt totally alien there. I felt, I don't know what's going on here. Mm. I don't know my fraud here. Am I capable yeah. of doing anything? But then I think when we started up and I saw people coming in and then the others leaving because they did what needs to be done, which in fairness was all they kind of said they do. I thought, sure, you can't leave now when, you know, when you've opened a door to someone. Yeah. And I can't believe looking back that that's where my life took me. Mm. That's Thank, a long time ago, no? 40 years, yeah. I mean, I, I, I looked up something, I think even this time 40 years ago, I remember going with one of the original members who was of the original group interviewing social workers about starting up a centre, you know, and that's mm-hmm. recorded. So it's 40 years this year that I would have been involved. I can't believe it's 40 years. Know, congratulations. My two kids yeah. can. I mean, they're in their <laughs> 40s now, my two daughters, mm-hmm. but because there were times when they were sick of it. How has times changed? Like, what was the sexual violence, rape landscape, or what was it like 40 years ago compared to now? Has Ireland got worse, or is, is are we just more aware now? Well, I think 40 years ago, um, there was something, I have all the figures going back to 83 that were reported to the guards, because it was in the Village magazine a number of years ago, and I remember grabbing it and thinking I might want that at some stage. There's something like 35 reports in Cork City and County, there was something like 300 in the whole country. So the attitude was, it's not a problem, it's not happening. There's more robberies than rape or sexual violence. Um, the definition of rape was very narrow. I don't need to go physical to the definition, but it was basically penetration and that was it. You know, so if anybody was assaulted in any other way, it was um, sexual assault with a two-year maximum sentence in the district court, in the district court of all places. Mm. Um, I remember the first case we were involved in, um, in 84 and I remember there's queues outside the courthouse on Washington Street to go in because it was seen as a big drama because it didn't happen and like back then the clergy were very strong and the guards were very strong and they all wanted to believe that this wasn't happening mm. or you know domestic violence they believed happened but they believed it was wrong but it was part of the family so you weren't interfering with family values mm. because there was a guy there behaving badly and he needed to maybe be thrown out to cool off a bit but it was happening within family values but us coming along kind of saying you know young girls are getting raped and young guys are getting raped that was really interfering with family values mm. um, and the mantra of a lot of people back then without being crude about it was only whores get raped I mean that was it was really difficult I remember even the first day when we'd flag days um, do you remember you used to have the old little caravan on Patrick Street anybody who yeah. had a flag day you'd hire this caravan and I remember people looking at us and you get the usual stuff um I wish I'd get raped or, you know, what are you on about? Or it was very alien, I think. But you see, the, the difference was, I think, with Cork or with a lot of people, um, is you know what's happening. I knew what was happening. People would talk about a brother maybe who something happened when he was young 
and it was never the same since. Or they talk about a young girl that might have ended up up in our ladies because something was done or something happened. Yeah. So everybody in the street knew it. So I think from day one, um, from where I'm coming from, I found the people of Cork very supportive in their own way. Mm. Because even if the authorities didn't want to know, the people of Cork weren't going to be silent about it. Mm. You know, and we started off with no money. We started off, um, we were for a few months over the Key Co-op. And, you know, one of the days we were in the Key Co-op, because I knew there was a film there recently in the Key Co-op, and they said we left because it wasn't suitable. That was one of the reasons why we left. Because I think even to go into the Key Co-op in 83 was seen as being very radical, even though all they were selling was beans in the basement or lentils and, you know, different things like that. We were raided by the special branch. I have a newspaper cutting of us being raided by the special branch in 83, and they came in to where we were, like the... Rape crisis centre as it was then was um, a telephone in a filing cabinet and that was it. And then you put the phone back in. But you do a lot of publicity if you could yeah. um, to raise awareness about it. And mm. we were raided. I mean, it wasn't that was outrageous because... What was the suspicion, man? Like, what was the grounds Well, the raid? key co-op itself was seen as being very radical. I mean, there was a gay men's collective there. There was different groups meeting there. But mostly they were kind of about environment, more environment issues than mm-hmm. other kind of issues at that stage. So... Like that was the reality back then. That was a difficulty. Yeah, pe- people like, were trailblazers back then, so because obviously some of those movements are very popular today, but back yeah. those it was kind of cutting mm-hmm. edge. Like you're talking about yeah. the, the era where, um, you know, the young woman in Watford or in Wexford who lost a job in a school because she was having a relationship with a, a local man who owned a pub, even though he was divorced and she was quite able and capable and free to have a relationship with him. She lost a job and went to court twice. And she still lost her job over it. You know, a young girl, um, Anne Lovett up in Granard, you mm. know, who was 15 year old, was found dead giving birth um, by a grotto mm. at 15 years of age. So there's a lot of things happening around that era were, that were very it, difficult for around, people. Around this time as well, wasn't this, if, it, if a rape happened within the marriage, it wasn't rape legally. That only changed in 1990. What was it like? Like, would you have had, like, wives coming to you and then, like, but, but, but there's a law then that says You'd have that. to say you can't take it for rape, yeah, you can do it for assault. But even even now, if you think that that law changed in the early 90s, there's only been four successful convictions for marital rape. How does a law like that get changed? Is it a matter of marching on streets and lobbying politicians? And, and campaigning, because I even found something where in 1982, 83, we did a big um, proposal like to change legislation to... Because if you look at male rape, it didn't need a law to change that, it just needed an addition to the law that was there. Um, child sexual abuse to change stuff like that. It just needed people to really campaign and change it and talk about it. Like even up today, um, we've been campaigning to get stalking to be a standalone law. And I just saw before I came out where the Minister for Justice, who last year wasn't unsure if we needed a standalone law, has said she's introducing a standalone mm. law, which is great. Mm. You know, but things that wouldn't have even been discussed in the doll back then and wouldn't have been talked about or... You know, if I look back, um, if to say what it was like in the early years, all I can say is I think it was quite lonely because mm. it's quite isolated and just people say who would love to get involved with us now, who wouldn't touch us back then, who wouldn't also, touch us. I remember even f- the first people on um, mini marathons, mm. the really courageous young women who might say, I want to wear your T-shirt. And there'd only be two or three of them because it was a big statement to say, I'm supporting this. Because what do they think you were saying? You hate all men. And we've never said that. And I don't think any woman ever believes that. But mm. that was the thinking or kind of you don't talk about that. That's shameful. You, you know, you put it under. Um, so in... During the time, I think maybe 25 years ago, or twenty when we were 21, we changed the name to Sexual Violence Centre Cork because I was still meeting people who were saying I didn't know my brother could come in. Um, I didn't know I was abused as a child. I didn't know I could come in. Or the majority might say um, it wasn't rape, Mary, because it wasn't I wasn't pulled in from somewhere. It was somebody I knew and he just forced it on me. Um, could you really call that rape? Or I was out of it. I don't know if I consented or not. Could you really call that rape? So... Um, we just decided, let's look and see what we can do to kind of include people. Mm. You know, I mean, I think at the start in 83, it had to be called Rape Crisis Centre to raise awareness. But then after that, I think you kind of look at who's coming in and what their needs are. And it took me a while to adjust to the change, all right. It was Dola there who was with me who was pushing it because um, I nearly felt like I was betraying the people who started. But sometimes you can be very blindsided. It was a bit like, like being honest, like when men started coming in or men wanted, I was a bit kind of, doubtful about were we the right place yeah. because we were and then I, I really had to own up and say of course we're the right place you're being a bit of 
an asshole like at this stage even thinking it but I think if I hadn't worked that through my own head mm. I might have kind of felt when the guy was coming in um, are we the right place for you or why are you here whereas that all went you know when you look at your prejudice and look yeah. at your hang ups even though you might feel ashamed of them they just they just leave you go like you're just gone then and mm. You know, these days, whether a guy or woman rings up, it makes no odds for, we're not surprised, you know. Um, the majority who come in are women and are young women, but there's still quite a lot of men coming in, especially after COVID, where you'd have maybe men in their 40s, 50s who might have been abusive children who are um, hardworking men who used to be busy and now they weren't busy and they're going off their game mm. and remembering stuff that happened, you know. Mm. How do you deal with that then when it's a man? You know, as 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 being a female, how do you deal with a man coming in saying that he's after been raped twenty years ago? How do you comfort him? Do you have a male within the? And a lot of them want women because they've yeah. been abused by a guy. Okay. I mean, we do have really you know good male counselors outside who we can refer to if that's what they want. But a lot of them at this start want to talk to women, and sometimes, you know, very few people want to go back into detail about what happened or back into remembering every bit of it. And that's the fear I think that if they come in, they'll have to go way back into it. but they don't it's just about how it affects them how they can move on and the two big things that keeps them stuck is um, feeling guilt and feeling shame mm. you know the guilt would be I shouldn't have done this um, I should have done things differently or the shame would be maybe what the abuser said when they raped them you know you really like this or you really love it or you really want it or say when children are abused you could have a young girl who she could only be six or seven you know and mm. he gives her toys or he gives her braces or he gives her a comic and she nearly feels when she grew up like she prostituted herself. Mm. And it's kind of different for guys because they nearly feel worse in a different way because I remember um, one of the counsellors saying about one guy that was in and she really felt there was still something he wasn't saying. Like he'd done a lot of stuff and he came in because, um, let's say a girl will come in because she say, I've met a lovely guy. I really want to be with him but I can't be close, even though he's nothing like the abuser. Mm. She's stuck there somewhere. So we help her kind of around her relationship, her intimacy, that kind of a thing. And I remember he was saying he had a lovely relationship um, and then he had a child and he was afraid to touch a child in case he'd become an abuser because you mm. have this myth, this bullshit that goes around that if you're abused, yeah. then you would be an abuser and that's rubbish. Mm. Like he had no traits of abusing. And what happened when he was young, um, the abusers know what they're doing. They know how to get bodies to react to things. So I suppose this young guy, when he's a boy, um, was getting aroused. So when he looked back, he said, sure, I was aroused, therefore I was taking part in it. Yeah. And he was a child. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way your head, you get mixed up in your head about, because the abuser will mix you up in your head. He will say, it's your fault. He will say, you're bold. He will say, um, you're evil. They don't even have to threaten you. They just... Mm -hmm. No, they just know. You know they just the, do it. And, so and that's that's how you help one guy yeah, by yeah. kind of helping him really work through it. Really, who is the abuser here? And he left feeling so free, left feeling so free mm -hmm. that he was able yeah. to bath his daughter and enjoy time and whatever. And and that's what I mean. If you can help people with the guilt and the shame, that's it. And that's all he probably wanted for, from life. I think that's all, all he wanted. They want, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a, did you ever watch The Keepers on Netflix? It's yeah. a documentary about, it's an, an Irish-American school, I think it's in um, yeah. Baltimore. Yeah. But one of the girls was being abused, but um, she orgasmed when she was only a child now. Exactly. And she grew up then believing like that she brought it on herself and that, but like it really messed up her head later yeah. in life, but like she she didn't know what was going on in her body, do you know what I mean? Exactly. But the, the manipulation was very deep uh, and it just kind of remember when when you said it there that that, that guy got rose and how that, that might mess with your head later in life. Yeah, and they know how to do it, like the abusers know how to do it. And then, you know, in sexual abuse, one thing I will find over the years, we, Ireland, we were great for covering things up. Like, you know, mm. I mean, I find the years in the centre is about uncovering, it's uncovering. Like, say, back then, it was rape of girls. So we only thought about um, bringing people to court and accompanying them that way. And then, I think in 84, the first person came in who had been abused as a child. And then there was a State of Fear programme that um, opened up all the institution abuse of boys in institutions and girls in different places. And then, you know, lately we're kind of more involved in working with people who've been trafficked for sexual exploitation in Ireland. So it's all the time uncovering stuff, but at least Ireland is uncovering it. We need to do more, but back then it wouldn't have been covered. It was been covered up. So that does give me hope. Mm. You know, things are being opened up a bit more. Yeah. Um, 
we had uh, Dr. Bessel van der Kork on the podcast last week and he wrote a book around how the body responds to trauma. And when, in his book, he talks about uh, people who've been sexually abused as children later in life find the heart to be intimate. But he, mm-hmm. he gave this um, example of, he names her Marilyn in the book. Mm-hmm. Marilyn finds it very difficult to have relationships. Mm-hmm. So she could she was going up with this guy anyway and things were going great. They went back to her house. They did nothing now but they slept together and she woke up in the middle of the night and he was asleep but he turned around and touched off her innocuous now and she lost the plot and yeah. attacked him but he was saying like in traumatized people the body doesn't understand the difference between something like that and danger and it just reacts as if it's danger and even internally the body can you know see an innocuous event like that and attack its own body as well and it it can Mm -hmm. manifest in a chronic illness you know but um very difficult to walk through and i'm sure you come across it a lot yeah because the body does remember even like you know you could have somebody who's been raped and then she might be starting to go out again um and she might be in a place which is nothing like where you know the event happened and all of a sudden she gets a panic attack and her body kind of remembering there's some kind of danger there and then sometimes they think they're losing it so Mm. that's kind of where we can help them out and support them and you know showing them like you say really something physically even showing them how the mind and body works it's not always about Mm. how you're feeling because you feel shit yeah you know and and, you know i've no time for spending hours and hours of people just going around in that cycle if there's some way of showing them well we know you feel really awful but this is another side of, of, of it that you can't control. This is mm. how your body's reacting. Sometimes that can be a massive relief yeah. for people that they think they're not going yeah. mad, you know? know. We had another lady on, um, Rebecca Donnelly. She was on the podcast as well and she spoke about an experience that she had as, as a child and it was blocked out and it was put into the back of her mind. And she went through her life with a thing called fibromyalgia. Um, she used to get chronic pain and didn't really realise where it came from but as she went down on her own journey she would have used um, plant medicines okay. and she, through ayahuasca she was able to release that pain and all these memories of what happened why this pain came on started coming to her during these experiences and stuff like that and it healed for her yeah, you know? yeah. See, she didn't even she wasn't even conscious that it was because of this she 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 put these things to the real back of her mind but it, it pain can come true in different ways from experiences mm-hmm. of trauma like that you know and, and i understand that like myself from my own experiences as well like my own body there's stuff that comes up for me and i'm saying where does this come from we were speaking about uh shame there earlier on and i'm saying like where does the shame come from like you know where does it come from and i'm looking further back into my own family life at the yeah. moment and it's making sense now to me where it actually came from and why it's so strong and i'm looking into it a little bit deeper and it's making a lot more sense and it's and it's making it a lot easier for me and it's not as strong as it was before yeah you know, so and if people like again on that podcast that we did with Bessel, we spoke a lot about like forms of therapy other than medication and talking therapies because people might know a bit about them but you can actually work through trauma without actually disclosing the intimate details to another oh, person you know and that's that can put a lot of people off i think i think asking somebody like i know there is a belief out there that you have to go back in there and nearly dig up your hole before you heal i think that's awful i mean why re traumatize yourself because mm. all people want is to kind of live their life in the best way they can they don't necessarily have to go back to the whole lot and we do different kinds of therapy we do art therapy which mm. like we see from 14 up and we've always kind of seen that young age group and they love doing it that kind of way because young people don't want to sit on a chair across with somebody else and you know, there's a, a thing of sometimes with counsellors, which can work for some people, where if there's silences, you just leave, sit in the silence. I'm not great for sitting in the silence, mm. as they call it. And young people definitely wouldn't. They'd be gone for the door, like. Yeah, yeah. They wouldn't <laughs> even tense, say goodbye. They're just gone, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, sometimes if they're up moving, doing something, talking, doing art, you know, and art isn't just with a, with a paint. It could be clay. It could be anything. Um, just to keep you in the away. present moment, you know. Yeah, they just talk away, you know, and, you know, they'll stay for... 20 minutes half an hour an hour and then keep coming back you know until do it in their way and I think that's how it has to be yeah. Yeah. you know I think the talking therapy that you know we do in this side of the world is alien in other parts of the world or a lot of the people you see who might be asylum seekers they would nearly see a counsellor somebody who's going to advise them and help them out and why not 
Do you know why not? If you have some information and then because if somebody is unsettled, like either homeless or, in, you know, just in a refuge or somewhere where they're, they don't have any structure, you wouldn't go to counselling or deep therapy, as they call it with them, then mm. it's just really helping them get through. So you have to look at people in different ways and see, well, OK, what's your need and what can we do and what, what can we not do? And be honest about what we can't do. It's like you yeah. talk about addictions. If somebody came to us and said they had addictions, they needed help, we're not the people to help them. I mean, we wouldn't try, yeah. you know, because we don't have the experience or the capacity or the facilities or mm. we don't want to kind of um, send people feeling worse, you know, if they are struggling with one kind of difficulty and then you wouldn't go into abuse when somebody's trying to deal with something else so it's a bit I think kind of of knowing a bit what you can do and what you can't Mm. do and you know you can't do everything you know you really need to know where the boundaries are too where you can and cannot go for someone's own for their safety and and you know do you know how you find out the person will tell you yeah Mm. I mean it's you know counsellors are not the experts the person will tell you and all you have to do is listen to them because all you can do is be a guide like I don't do counselling in there I do more um, you know the running the centre, doing the media stuff, doing the education stuff in schools, which I love doing. I miss doing that this year, doing, you know, talking yeah. to things, just raising awareness, because yeah. I know um, the majority of people in Ireland, you, you probably find this, that Irish people are still very private about going for counselling or that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. So the majority won't go into a centre. But um, what I try and do by the shouting and the roaring is by changing the victim blaming and even by talking about the male rape, because that's still very hidden. And it happens because rape is about power and control. It's, like that's it I'd love if we look at kind of the rape of the elderly and unfortunately we've met women in their 70s who've been raped like and people can't even bear thinking about that I'd love if they looked at young girls who were raped and look at it in the same way that it's still the same black and white because sometimes when a young girl gets raped all of a sudden it's grey and it's not grey mm-hmm. and then guys feel very um Ashamed, as you were saying, and, and shame because they might see the abuser the next day and they might say, I could have taken him out with one blow. What happened to me? Mm. And I think it's because, you know, you've heard a lot over the past few days about women going around with keys in their hands, women watching what they're mm. doing. Um, I think if a guy's walking up and sees somebody come behind him, he thinks he's going to get his head kicked in. The last thing you think about is that he might get sexually assaulted. Mm. So I think when after it happens to a guy, he doesn't know who he is as a person, as a man. You know, as his ego is just totally out of his being, out of his thinking. Where a girl, it, you know, nobody wants it, but it's something you've been told since you were a very young child to fear happening, you know. Mm. So part of the thing I think we need to do in the centre is just raising awareness about it. Going back to what something you said there brought up something for me. You were speaking about uh, females walking the streets, carrying their keys in their hands. You know, and being completely paranoid walking past gangs of youths and whatever. I remember towards the end of my own um, addiction, you know, I was completely paranoid and I would have felt like that. But I would have never, ever thought that females, women, you know, I knew men did because of the lifestyle we live, James, and we often spoke about that. But I actually didn't know that women felt that much in fear until I listened to it on the radio. And it just kind of, it opened up my mind a little bit more and... We start to think about, like, even you know, w- when men look at women, say an attractive woman, and you know, they'd wolf whistle or whatever, these different things. And I said, it's, on part, it's, so, it? unpro- it's so wrong. You no, know, after here, I never kind of understood it to that degree that women so- feel so unsafe around, around men that they have to carry their it's, keys. It's hard for us to hand. imagine what it's like to be a woman, like, because I've never walked through town or down the lane where and felt like afraid or having yeah. I've never had to like have keys in my hand you know I'm not an animal to fight by no means but I, kn- I know I'm not going to be overpowered and, and assaulted like that I don't know even if he is a big guy you know what I mean so it's very hard for men to actually you can't put yourself in the shoes of a woman you know yeah, and, and I think, like I say, the majority of assaults, the majority of rape happens by somebody you know. 80% people are raped by somebody who they know is your best friend, is your brother's best friend, is somebody you really feel comfortable with. That's why I think a lot of them don't report it because they feel, how can they? And, you know, it's amazing how many of these guys rape so close to home because they know the person won't report it. But I think even stuff, you know, you talk to a young girl who kind of come in and she say, I really shouldn't be here because, you know, people are a lot worse than me, but she'd been groped on the street or she'd been all this kind of stuff. And her friends would say, like, would you ever get over it? Sure, it happens to us all. Um, you know, or 
putting your hand under her skirt in a bar or doing this kind of stuff, which girls have kind of had to tolerate and put up with for, for so long. Mm-hmm. And that's where, where it has to stop. But just something that came into my head too about um, young boys coming in, like say young guys maybe coming in for counselling who would say they might have been assaulted by other guys where it's, they grab their gentle area and all of a sudden it's called horseplay. You know, and so you'd be a guy kind of saying, you're doing this, and they know it's abuse, it's yeah. not, but it's very turned to horseplay when it comes to young guys being assaulted. Now, a girl is kind of, would you get over yourself, or mm. you're such a prude, or, you know, you're a prick tease, or you're yeah. all kind of language they have to use. And I'm really hoping, you know, the conversation that's going on at the moment will start challenging that and saying, yeah. you know, that's enough. Because I think, you know, like you say, the majority of guys, you're walking home, you're just walking home thinking about what you're going to do or what you have to do. And there's somebody walking in front of you um, and she's really aware of you walking behind, but she doesn't know whether you're the good guy or the bad guy, mm-hmm. you know. And I think I think men like are starting to become aware of that and aware of kind of what they can do and what they can't do. And that maybe the woman in front needs a bit of space, let her get ahead. And then, you know, maybe mm-hmm. even just stand back for a minute so she gets ahead. Because sometimes... It's hard for a guy to know what to do if you go ahead of her. She might be thinking, is he waiting up the top of the road now for me or that kind yeah. of thing. So maybe just hold back, leave her. Yeah, even consent. Like, leave her um, go. Like when we were young, there was no talk of consent in the, in the 90s, you know. And, and I often wonder, like, do they do that in schools these days? Is that something that you do educate young boys because people become sexually mature 13, 14, 15, do you know? Yeah. And like, if... If, if we teach them consent age appropriate at that age, um, and just, just just to like let people know that it's not appropriate to grab a girl by the arse yeah. or to, to grab her by the chest, you know, even if your testosterone is coming out through your ears exactly. and you're 14, 15. I mean, they do, they do consent in schools, I suppose. They don't start young enough, I think. Mm. You know, I mean, I think you need to start in, in primary school about consent, about, you know, taking somebody's book or what you can or you can't do. But I mean, the other side is, um, most guys wouldn't grab somebody's breasts or wouldn't grab their arse, you know, because mm. they know they don't have consent. Yeah. But the guys that do it don't want consent. That's the other side. Yeah. But, and like I know there's a lot of stuff going on in third level colleges about consent. Mm. Like I think it's the idea of going to a third level college with 18, 19 year old men and telling them about consent is ridiculous mm. because they know at that stage. Yeah. And the thing is the guys who most guys are getting consent. That's how they partner. That's how they have relationships. That's what they want. But the ones um, who want power and control don't want consent. So we do need to keep talking about it. My fear would be that um, somebody could turn around and kind of say, um, Jesus, you know, I didn't know this because I haven't gone to a consent class, that kind of stuff, mm. you know. Um, and enough. in court, I find like court, um, of all the things I do over the past 40 years, I've seen things changing in the guards hugely over the past 40 years and you know we've a protective services unit in Anglesey Street who just deal with sexual crime mm. which is great because before that you were dealing with you know good guards but you were trying to find them they were out in the car or they were gone off for a week or they were transferred or they weren't really that pushed about it um, or there's so many other things to investigate but you know some of the people in the protective services unit in Anglesey Street are just brilliant yeah. you know I'm onto one of them you know so I should Claire Corcoran I'd be onto her every week about something. She's been really supportive and great with people and she deserves that kind of acknowledgement, I think. But I go back into court with people and I'm back 40 years. I really feel, you know, no, do you ever go somewhere and you can feel your heart dropping, you feel your stomach dropping yeah. and you're with somebody and you're trying to support them, like keep straight up and support them. But every part of me just drops when I go into court because that has not changed in 40 years. Notoriously, it's one of the hardest convictions to get. And mm-hmm. it's probably the only trial where the victim is probably the one that's grilled more than the perpetrator. So the perpetrator doesn't even go on the stand most of the time. You know, I mean, in a case recently where, you know, there's two perpetrators. So that meant the girl who was only 19 at that stage had to, she was underage when it happened. And they were well over age, like when they raped her. She had to be questioned by two barristers. Mm. And plus the state barrister, because they don't have their own rest separate legal representation. The state decides if there's going to be a case to be taken and the state will allocate somebody to take the case, not to be their kind of barrister as such. Mm. So um, it's adversarial system is not fit for purpose. And I think no matter how much you try and tweak it, it's not going to change things. And things that wouldn't be allowed, I think, in the UK, where there's the same system, is allowed here. Like some of the things that the girl is asked, shouldn't be asked, or the young guy or whoever's on the stand. Because it, it can be men too. I remember being with a man um, who would have been abused in a school as a child and he was on the stand and he was asked, um, 
They called out loads of teachers that, that he had and what did they teach? Sure, he couldn't remember what they taught. I mean, I think it's like you said about trauma, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, sometimes when you're traumatised, you, you forget small details. Yeah, but they made a deal out of that kind of saying, well, I mean, you're in this school for so long. You had that teacher for so long. Are you telling me you didn't know what they taught English or geography? And this is all to discredit the victim. Yeah. And that's what happens in court cases before they even get as far as what happened. They look and see, how can I discredit the victim? How can I discredit you? And I just find the court system really appalling. It's, what's going through my head now at the moment is, is imagine being a solicitor on the the defence side and fighting the case for a guy that's actually completely guilty. You know, how do how do, how do fellas, solicitors do that? They might be paid handsomely, but... They just be professional and just it, go by the book, I'd say. And, you see, and then the next time, you know, I could see a barrister there and I could feel really angry with, you know, the question and how he's treated, but the next time in court, he's on our side. So this, there's not like, you know, in the States where you'd have the prosecution service and the defence, yeah. they do both sides. So I go in and I'd talk to them and I wouldn't know to like which, which side they're on. That's right. know, so, so there's no like prosecution and defence. It's like they do both. They do both. That's ridiculous. I mean, there is a state, <laughs> there is a state solicitor who will allocate who yeah. decide um, we're taking the case or not. And then they will go down to Cork and say, OK, this is the case. Who's going to um, prosecute and who's going to defend? So, you know. Did I hear a, out. Do I remember a case in Cork in the last couple of years where the prosecutor pulled out the underwear of the victim did. and paraded it? And it wasn't even her, her that underwear has been bought, I think it's somewhere like pennies. It was kind of these um small piece of underwear that young girls wear, which everybody wears. I mean, trying to find any kind of other underwear yeah. is impossible. Um it's what they wear. It, I, it's beyond me how they wear them, but it's what they wear. Like, mm. um, that's because these days the gym pants and tracks ones are so tight that yeah. you have to wear something so small. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then that was pulled out as as if it was encouraging rape. I mean, how was that even allowed in a court case? Though, like, if you want to wear underwear, like, isn't that like how was that? And that evidence, shouldn't have been allowed because that mm. wasn't even years ago. I'd find clothes would be pulled out. This is what you wore. I haven't seen that now in a long time where they pull out clothes, that kind of a thing. But this was even in the roundup where she was kind of showing the jury, this is what she was wearing. Does that not mean she was looking for sex or she's looking for rape? What if, so what if she's looking to go out and catch up with someone for the night and yeah. go off with someone for the night? That's her own business. Yeah. You know, that is our own business. We're not, you know, back in the 50s. But I think what I liked out about that was the outrage that went on afterwards. And I think mm. that particular barrister got a bit of a shock with the outrage that happened on the protest at Patrick Street and the protest over by the yeah. steps because um, things that happened for years. But I think, you know, Liam Halen, the journalist, when he mentioned it in his article or in his report, court reporting, that really opened people's eyes. This is really what's happening. And I then you're in court. It. I and didn't the girl think is, that that would happen in this yeah, day and age. Anything can happen. You see, it's mm. it's the adversary system and the guy is innocent to prove guilty. So he can, they just sit there and say not a word during the trial. Do you think women are getting a lot more attention these, the, these days? 2020 than they were maybe back in the 80s and 90s particularly around the dress sense like you just said it there the gym wear is a big thing and let's be honest like women do look very attractive in these clothes because I think the social media shows, as well you know yeah. um, do you think that there's like in this culture that we have right now where our image is like the king yeah. do you think that um, it contributes I don't I mean, I think body image is awful for kind of both young men and young yeah. women, the way they have to look and get rid of the bumps and get rid of all this kind of stuff. But, um, you know, we see women, say, who might be part of the Muslim community. I mean, they're kind of covered from head to toe. We see elderly women. We see women in their 50s. It's nothing to do yeah. with what they wear. And like I say, the majority are raped by somebody who they know mm. who decides they just want to do this. So it's nothing to do with, you know, what they wear. If it was... I'm sure women would decide to put plastic bags over themselves or we do something yeah, if yeah. we knew, OK, you know, there's a certain um, being out there called a male who can't resist this if you show a bit of an anchor. But that's not the truth because, you know, the majority of men would not dream of doing this. Yeah. Might look at someone and say, God, yeah. she's lovely. But they don't follow through by saying, and I'd love to rape her. <laughs> and it's about power anyway. You said a while ago, it's not necessarily about the gender even or the looks of the person. Yeah. It's more like a power it is. struggle mm -hmm. yeah. or a, a power strip. I want to ask you about um, something you touched on a while ago. It's around um, refugees, non-Irish nationals 
involved in sex work and that trade. Do you get people like that coming into your service as well? We would have. I mean, we started off in 2006, we got involved in um, Stop Sex Trafficking in Cork. And I think it was just a fluke again, because I was asked to speak of something in UCC, I think, and sure, I knew nothing about it. And I remember there was a guard there from Limerick who had been in Bosnia or something. And he said he went over really cynical about this, but came back with his eyes open. And I remember after leaving that talk, there was about 40 people hanging around. Now, you know, on a Saturday morning, you'd have maybe 20 or something like this. Yeah. And then... They wanted to do something more about it. There was a lot of um, women, a lot of people who'd been on the missions who were really aware of it, who had been working with young children mm. who had trafficked sexual exploitation. And then it was kind of like an eye opener for me to realise this is happening. So we started working with that. And then a couple of years ago, we started up Cork Against Human Trafficking, involving a lot of organisations and agencies. And, you know, we're on a committee in justice um, to do it sex trafficking and labour trafficking because we did extend it you know when we look at a few nail bars that were raided there around Christmas time and um, mushroom farms that were raided because guys are trafficked all the time more yeah. for labour for you know lorry driving for mushroom farms for fishing or industry cannabis, all sorts of things ma- marijuana yeah, all I was in prison things. with a few Vietnamese guys but they were trafficked over from Asia but they had an awful life. And when they were finally raided, they were sentenced to prison. But they were actually slaves inside in the factory exactly. and not allowed to leave. It's happening know. like in plain sight. But the thing about Ireland, I find on trafficking, like say there's this um, report, trafficking in a person's report, it's brought out by the States every year. And it goes through every country in the world and rates kind of where you are as regards your response to trafficking. Um, and you know, say if you have a rate from one to five, five is kind of you're really doing your own stuff and four is kind of like, you're not too bad, you're getting there. Three is kind of, you're barely standing, but you're kind of mm. um, acknowledging this is happening. Ireland at one stage was on three and now we went out to two. And then it was thought, like last year, they thought they'd, you know, go up a grade. Now two would mean uh, we were doing the same human rights as Romania and Saudi Arabia. Mm. We're the only country in Western Europe that's on that radar, that's kind of on a watch list as kind of a country where Ireland is not adhering even to the most basic human rights of trafficking. Because when it comes to um, prostitution, our stand would be that um, we certainly wouldn't be in favour of criminal of, of legalising it. Because I think if you legalise prostitution, like people might say, well then, if you look at New Zealand or Germany, where it's legal, you can set it up in Patrick Street. And I can guarantee you the women who are in the in the trade will not be allowed to work on their own because the pimps will take over. Yeah. So, I mean, it's made their day. All of a sudden, what they've been trying to do um, behind people's back, all of a sudden, is legal. So they can do whatever they want. Yeah. And I know in New Zealand, you know, they set up with when all the rugby matches are on, besides crashes, they set up everywhere. I know in Germany, where they legalised it, where there's something like 400,000 women in prostitution. And the idea was that they'd all pay their own tax. They could be employed in only a couple of hundred managed to kind of get to that stage of being self-employed because the pimps took over and there's huge big yeah. um, places in Germany now and you'd nearly cry looking at them. They'd be the size of a penny's place where there's big signs outside um, um, a fuck and a pint for a tenner or something. So, and the That's pimps nice. will talk about um, these people as merchandise. That's the term they use. They're disposable. They're mm. merchandise. And even, you know, when I see it happening in here and we have... You know, so far only watched about maybe eight or ten women who have been trafficked. But I mean, to look into their eyes, there's absolutely no way to go back and say, tell us about what happened, because I don't know where their soul is. and They're barely yeah. getting through. So our role, as I see with them, is to help them um, get somewhere to live, is to help them kind of live their life till they're ready to do something. And sometimes, you know, even if they're out of it and safe, sometimes they might go back into that trade for a while. And it's about like somebody might say, why would I do that? And I'd say, well, what else do they know? You know, what else do they, do they know? I mean, they won't stay there because we'll try and really help them through it. I know Katrina um, Toomey has talked about this before too. She's come across people. So it is about really looking at her straight on. And, yeah. you know, the sites that the guys go on to look for these women, if anybody looked at the comments because they rate them, and if you look at the comments, it's, you know, it's not what people might think. It might not be, you know, well... She wasn't as good looking as she says in a photograph and she was really older than I thought. It's nothing like that. It's a bit like, you know, she was young, she was Asian, um, she was quite petite. Um, she decided she didn't want anal and that was fear definite, but I've opened the door for your lads. 
So when you go, mm. I mean, what's that saying that, you know, they've yeah. already only raped her and that's mm. where they're rated. So we need to get rid of this rubbish mm. that um, it's doing no harm. It's doing a huge amount of harm. And it's rubbish that men go in there for comfort because like it's not like the 50s where you couldn't have a relationship with somebody of your own thing. Men aren't doing this. The men are doing it are men, mm. middle aged or middle class, really, in their 30s, 40s. Um, have a couple of kids, things are really well in their life. They go out for the few drinks, they go out wherever, and this is their extra. Mm. You know, whereas I think, um, I really think the working class guys or the guys in the street who are struggling to survive see the human rights in it and see that it is harm and see that they wouldn't want their sister involved in this. So, you know, you can't kind of say it's okay. And if it's okay for you, then you have to say it's okay for you and your family to be engaging in this. So there's all myths out there that I just yeah. want to blast away, you know, because it is... It's slavery. It is slavery. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's modern day slavery. There was, that's great, it there was a great TV series on RT. I don't know if you've seen it. It was it followed a African, it was an African mistress. Is that the term? But she herself was trafficked in, but then she became a trafficker and she yeah. ran the battle. But there was a couple of Eastern European girls and a couple of African girls being kind of moved around. Yeah. And they were brought over to the Galway races and then they were brought to to Edinburgh and they were brought to Dublin and yeah. different festivals and that's how they were moved around, you know. It's the same as that film they are taking with yeah. Nielsen. Yeah. That actually frightened yeah. me to see the, the, if that was real and it's, it, it possibly is it real. It is real, yeah. That actually scared me because I have a, I have a, girl, a daughter as well like in, in the, to imagine something like that to happen to her, um, I'd be completely devastated. As would any other father or our brother yeah. or our Even mother. Madeline McCann and like their traffic babies too and children, you know. Yeah, like and you see, it's all about demand. If there's no demand, it won't happen. So if the guys who were going in, you know, decide this is their right to kind of um have sex or rape a young girl who they don't know if they're stopped. I mean, the legislation is that it is a criminal offence not to do it. Um, but I think very few guys have been brought to court. But, mm. you know, it's just getting them to stop doing it and realising that, you know, it is slave trade, it is, it's a human rights issue. And that's yeah. the end. There's a great, we'll just mention Cyril Horgan's movie as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the name of it again, Mary? Do you know I can't name? remember. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> we but link it in the description. I know, yes, it, even will, though we all stood outside the City Hall where yeah, they drove around exactly, for, yeah. for ages, yeah. And it was, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't, I can't just get it. But anyhow, that was a film made exactly about what we just spoke about, about a young lady being uh, trafficked into the country, an Eastern European lady, um, and moved around from different place to place by a, a female pimp, if, yeah. if that's the right word. And she managed to get in contact with the Gardaí and whatever and take and all those. But you could see during that film, I actually cried during the film because I could see the devastation in her face. Is that where you were, the MC? Yes. To introduce the, yeah. oh, at the premiere. Um, I could see the, the pain that she was going, the actress who played that part was absolutely, she played it brilliantly as well. But um, if uh, more men seen that, they would understand the pain behind it. A lot of men, as you said earlier on, they would be, on drugs or alcohol while they're looking for a prostitute or whatever and they, they don't really understand what they're doing. They, they just want the next fix, as you said there earlier on. Um, but if they're seeing these films while they're sitting at home and their kids are up in bed or their wife is out in the kitchen and like it could really change things. And I think we thought that was their daughter or their yeah. sister mm. who was in it. Or I think if we looked at kind of why is it okay that, you know, strip clubs are around why is it okay that you know women need to do things half naked why is that acceptable do you know that if you have a you know a stag party or something that you might bring a few women in because I know like a few Irish women who I'd be very close to who would be involved in prostitution who were raped during you know parties like this who were doing it to survive and then it seems to be tolerated it seems to be well you know you're doing this you're, you're only a whore you're a fair mm. game do you mm. know that attitude needs to stop we, I guess you're following the Ghislaine Maxwell yeah, yeah. case. Um, there's great uh, documentaries and that as well, but it ju it's always the poor and the vulnerable, isn't it, that are trafficked in these rings. Do you think that the, that, that type of an elitist kind of fraternity or ring exists in Ireland oh, too? I do, totally, totally. I mean, if you look at, like I was saying, the average guy who will go in and buy, you know, and, and 
buy a prostitute because you're really buying somebody's body for that length of time. Usually they're guys who are fairly doing okay in their life. They're kind of in their 30s, 40s. They're married, a couple of kids. They have extra money. They have their drink. They have their house. They do this as an extra thing they want to do. Um, mm. Absolutely. And just feel nothing wrong with buying somebody, buying a young man or a young woman like that. Do you think it's education is needed around us? Maybe men just need to I be educated huge education. around what I we're think speaking we, about. Huge education and looking at, you know, young girls as human beings as well. Mm. As human beings, not as men, something that can be used. A lot of men probably don't see it as we're speaking here today. They see it as, oh, she's getting paid for it. She's whatever, you know, they don't see it as in like hold up one minute maybe this female is is actually being trafficked into the country and mm. she's doing this yeah. not because and, and she sometimes wants they don't want to because sometimes you know? there was research done i know london at one stage where a lot of the men said they knew the girl had been trafficked and that they would report but they all kind of got what they paid for first you know yeah. mm. which is beggars belief you know so but i think a lot of irish people don't know this is going on and i really do believe that irish people hate injustice and that's what part of it is like informing people because they i think a lot of women would say they would hate if the husband went yeah. you know and paid for sex but he needs it because they might say um, i'm not interested anymore or i've been sick i'm not able and he has his needs and i think the majority of men Everybody has needs, but they don't necessarily go that route. I feel I need to be satisfied by raping mm. an 18 year old. Like I got a letter, God, it was only last year. I wish he'd put his name to it. Some alpha kind of saying, um, I'm lonely and I have my needs. You know, and my attitude was, does that mean you have to go in and meet a 19 year old who's probably young enough to be your granddaughter and, mm. you know, grope all over her body and have her kind of smile and say, it's OK, let's get a grip here, do you know? Yeah. You're not going to die, you know. But hopefully, there's men listening to this now and they'll have a little bit more awareness. Maybe the next time they're at a party and it's suggested, or maybe the next time they were thinking about doing it, just to think about, like, where did that girl come from? Who's her dad? Who's her mother and, and sister? And why does she need to do this? Like, yeah. why, yeah. you know, they're doing it because of economic needs or because of addiction needs, you know? Maybe against their will. They're not allowed to leave. The passport has been taken. Their families Absolutely. are under threat back in Romania. Yeah. This is the reality. I want to talk to you about Ashling Murphy because okay. it's a big topic at the moment. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was we spoke off camera about Rachel Kiley, the Ballancolic lady yeah. that was assaulted and murdered down in Ballancolic Park when she was out running. Um, and there's been a lot of cases of women being murdered at the hands of men, their partners, strangers. What is it about the Ashling Murphy case that has kind of shocked the whole nation that had people marching the roads and ha having vigils and all over all over the country. I think people identified with her. I think she was a teacher. You know, I mean, I did hate the phrase, she did the right thing. Does that mean if somebody, if a girl was drinking and was raped, that she did the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people identified her, Ashling. She was 22. She's a primary school teacher. She was a musician. Um, she did everything possibly. She had a good life. So I think people identified that that could be them. Whereas I think sometimes if a young girl gets raped or assaulted, they might say, well, that wouldn't happen to me. Or, you know, when we hear about the deaths in, in houses, like, you know, another woman murdered by the husband, it's about we turn a blind eye and say, well, that mightn't happen to me. Thank God I'm in a good relationship, which we like everybody in. But I think it did open people's eyes. But I think also like when Rachel died 20 years ago, and I know she was 21 or 22, she'd gone home. At five o'clock in the evening, she grabbed her two dogs, as she always did, and went for a walk. Because when I said that to some people this week, they said, I always go out with my dogs. Like this woman 20 years ago was with her dogs and those dogs came back and was scraping at the door before the mother realised there's something wrong here because mm. the dogs are back and my daughter isn't back. Um, but I think because we're chipping away for 20 years and men as well chipping away and keep the conversation going because, OK, we're a centre and we're quite visible in Cork because we like being visible and out there. But if we didn't have the support of the men in Cork, nothing would have changed. But I think because the conversation kept going and going and going and um, that when this did happen to Ashley Murphy, it was the final straw. I think it's not a watershed. I think it's a movement now mm. because the watersheds happened at different times over the years. But this was like enough is enough. Mm. Where do you think we go from here? How do, you, how do you see it evolving or do you see change coming about like in terms of the sentencing and the, the way the trials are held? Do you think that real change will come? 
I think the tries will be the same unless we change the adversarial system. Like we need to do something about that. But even the Minister for Justice there saying that she was changing the stalking law because, you know, we'd been fighting for the stalking thing and we started a stalking campaign a year ago. And the uh, word there was we didn't need a separate law that was covered under different laws. But, you know, she'd come out tonight and say, well, we do need a different law and we're going to change it. And I heard some men and women and all kind of saying for the, the guys, the few guys who are saying, you know, not all men that they need just to back off and shut up for now and just, you know, come out and support women and support people. So I think we just keep the conversation going because if the conversation hadn't been going for the past 30, 20, 40 years. What happened with the outpouring wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. It's just one yeah. one thing. So, no, I was just going to mention um, myself, James, were at the memorial down in um, Park Cueve last week for, for that Ashling and... Um, I saw a lot, a lot of men as well. No, mostly women, but there was a lot of men down there. Like, and it was good to see so many men, you know, um, just to to be there with their wives and 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 their daughters, and it was great to see it, you know. Um, and maybe there's a lot of men that really can start opening up these conversations we're having with other men and let's grow the consciousness around this, you know, around. I, I think the men are the only ones that can make yeah. a difference now. You know, even by, you know, calling out their friends, if they are doing a rape joke or if they are being toxic or if they are saying something about somebody and mm -hmm. just calling them out, men are the ones that can make a difference now. They really are because women they can't do anymore and, you know, can't defend themselves much more than they're doing nor should they mm -hmm. have to. And a lot of men are making contact with the centre, like you said, mm -hmm. you know, are totally unaware of the of the women carrying keys and totally unaware of mm -hmm. how they were. So men really are mm -hmm. the ones who need to kind of stand up and be counted at this stage. And I know it can be uncomfortable, but there's so many men like you who, do, who are so used to being uncomfortable at the least of, you know, what you've gone through in your lives that other men need to stand up and be uncomfortable and say, you know, this isn't done, this isn't mm. done. Because, like, when you think about, like, a woman, even if she was trained in, trained in a martial art, she's still going to find it very difficult to keep a full-grown man off her, you know? So it's, it is down to the men. And like, if there's ever anything we can do for your organisation or for any kind of um, anything you're working on, just let us know. But we wanted to do this because men, a lot of men watch the podcast and they might look up to me and Timmy and we wanted to just show people like, um, mm. like the, the thing why, why I think there were so many men at that vigil as well. It scares the life out of men as well. That that could be your daughter. That could be my yeah. wife out walking the dogs. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like Rachel. I think so, like, And yeah. like the thought of... Like the informal conversations men have, the maturity and all that, that that's actually a contributing factor to an act like this, you know. And so it's just to get that awareness that to nip it in the bud, call it out if you see it, um, because it could be anybody's loved one at the end of the day. And I and, I, I and really changes can that. happen. Do you know what I mean? Like, do we ever think we'd see a day where, you, you know, you wouldn't sit in the car after a few pints before, like you just would. You know, you'd have three or four and then hop in a car. Did we see a day where you wouldn't be smoking and work? We didn't. So, I mean, yeah. changes can happen. The culture can change. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully the time is now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Right. It is. I mean, I I feel very inspired and encouraged by the men who come along and the men who ring the centre and the men who kind of say, I didn't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I, I think it's great when the guys say, I just didn't know. And I take that you didn't know, but now you do. do you yeah. Know? And obviously the thoughts goes out to Ashley Murphy and yeah. family and totally, friends. Totally. And Rachel Kiley. Yeah. And, and you can imagine. And the 244 of the women who are murdered yeah. in the past 20 and, years. And yeah. all the victims of violence that yeah. this is after triggering for them. And there's so much mm. trauma now coming to the surface for families all over the country. So thoughts with every yeah. one of them. And thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks, great to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks okay. a million. And um, we see everybody next week. Thank you.